Good morning, St. Martins. It's wonderful to have you here. 
Please grab a tea and coffee, make yourself feel at home and settle down in your seats. We'll be starting the service in two minutes. Good morning, church. Yay! <laughs> We're going to start with some worship, so do join us.
unshakable hallelujah you have done great things hallelujah god above it all hallelujah god unshakable hallelujah you have done great things You conquered the grave, you free every captain and break every chain. No oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, my Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. A hero of heaven, you conquered. Good morning, everyone. Have a seat. It's great to be with you this morning. I'm glad to say it's slightly warmer than yesterday. I was traveling with a group of men down to the Alpha Away Day. We went through to the, down to Lou, and we hit the bottom of the Lou Valley. I looked at the car temperature on the car, two degrees. I thought, oh, that's cold. <laughs> And now I'm slightly concerned about the candles, because when I was last time, with this proximity of candles at doubles, I almost set myself on fire. And uh, Caroline's mum saved me. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> There's compassion right there. <laughs> if anyone sees flames, please tell me. It might not be the Holy Spirit. And so, if you're new here, a very warm welcome to you. And if you want to find out more about what we do and get a little bit more involved, we have these welcome cards. You can fill these out physically or you can do them online. And as you do so, there's a few options at the back. You can tick what you're interested in and fill those out. Send them back to us and we'll get in touch in with you. And we'd love to tell you a bit more about St. Martin's and what we're up to here. Some of the things that we're up to, well, uh, shortly, those of you who have already filled in a welcome card will have an email flying into your bo email box full of things that are going on this week and beyond. One of those things going on is 24 hours of prayer. This is something that here at St. Martin's we believe passionately about, devoting ourselves to prayer. It's important stuff. What we would like you to do is sign up to one hour, any point during those 24 hours, sign up to one hour, and you can do that online. You should have had a link come through. You should be able to see a link on Facebook, uh, if you're on Facebook, and you can uh, go through the 24-7 uh, web page, and there's a, an hour slot there. You can dedicate some time to God, and we'll send you a prayer pack through, so you've got things to pray about. And so your time does not have to be filled with silence, but you can read the Bible, dedicate yourself in meditative practices, uh, like reading the Bible and, and concentrating on those scriptures that we suggest, and prayer points in front of you. And then on Friday, what I haven't told you is there's other churches taking part this week in their own prayer events, which is fantastic, because it's not just us praying for Liscard, it's our brothers and sisters around Liscard and beyond praying for their communities. And then... The, there's four churches that have said they'll come here on Friday night and tell us, and we will tell them what God has told us through our times of prayer. Isn't that great? So 7 o'clock Friday night, we're having a praise and worship event here in St. Martin's where we can come and hear what God's been telling us throughout the week. And 
I hear something good went on yesterday. Yes, you're talking about the cold. Some of us felt the cold <laughs> quite a lot yesterday at Rooted for Women. Um, it was a wonderful day, though. Despite us feeling a little bit chilly, it was a wonderful day. There was about 30, 32 women joined together, and Joe over there with my favourite hoodie on with a massive rainbow on. Um, Joe did some great teaching um, about God, and obviously, and um, how um, he's working on us from the inside out, and, uh, and we are beautiful um, creations. And I, I want to use this opportunity to plug something that I plugged for the first time yesterday, so I'm going to be really quick, Steve, because I know you're precious of time. Um, but I wanted the ladies to know, so for all ladies in the room, please put in your diary, Saturday the 25th of March next year, we will be having a women's conference, and we are very excited to say that Lou Fellingham is going to come to Liscard, little old Liscard, um, <laughs> and lead the day. <laughs> So more details will be coming out, tickets and early bird tickets, early, early bird, so very, very early, early bird tickets are available now, so I will send out a link during the week, but if you're eager and you want it today, let me know and I'll pass it on to you. And very quickly, Mick thrust this upon me just a moment ago, 26th of November, a church Christmas market is happening here in St. Uh, Martin's uh, from 10 to 2 p.m. If I didn't say that, then he'd stop doing those wonderful things he does for me. And he does an awful lot. <laughs> so, let's think a little bit about scripture, shall we? Psalm 77 says this, Will the Lord reject forever? Will he show his favor again? Do you ever feel like that? Will God ever show his favor on me again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? What God is as great as our God? Let's think about this this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you thinking about your greatness, how the things of old we hear and we read about in your word mean so much to us that we hold on to those times. And Lord, let us see those times of miraculous things happen this day. Let us see them happen this week as we dedicate our lives to you, as we dedicate our lives in service to you once more. Let us see marvelous things break out in Lisgard and beyond. Amen.
never been anyone like you. You are worth me. You are worth me. Oh, there's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worth me. You are worth me. Thank you, God, that you are good. And we just want to praise your holy name this morning. And Lord, as the children go out to their groups now, Lord, I pray that they would meet with you this morning, that they would taste your goodness this morning, that you would reveal your heart for them this morning. Lord, would you bless our young people and bless those who lead them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Um, Joe shared the picture, which is quite a famous picture, of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And what's so special about that picture is there is no handle on Jesus' side. The only way it can be opened is if you open it. And I can't help but think of Revelation 3.20. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus is knocking. You need to open that door. And if you've come this morning and you've never opened that door, or maybe you've come and that door is just only a jar, a fraction, you haven't fully opened it this morning because for whatever reason, there's other things that you feel that you need to sort out before you can actually meet with Jesus. Well, Jesus really wants you to open that door and he really wants to meet with you this morning and he really wants to minister you to you this morning. So as we sing that chorus again, would that be a call and a cry of our heart that we are open the doors of our heart for him to come and meet with us and to feast with us because that is his heart for each one of us. And thank you, Jesus, that you care about each one of us individually and you know the journey that it's taken to get us here today. There is nothing that anyone can do that would make Jesus love you any less. Sure about this morning. Thank you, Lord.
you, Jesus. Father, we come to you in this moment, giving you ourselves. Holy Spirit, move upon us so we can give more. Holy Spirit, time seems so, so precious to fit everything in in life. And yet we forget, we forget to allow you in to allow you to speak to us, to allow God our Father in heaven to communicate with us. And you've given us this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit to do that with. So Holy Spirit, move upon us now. Move upon us in such a way that we will know that you are God. Holy Spirit, come and seep through us hold us, know us afresh. Psalm 51 says this, look on me with a heart of mercy, O God, according to your generous love, according to your great compassion, wipe out every consequence of my shameful crimes, thoroughly wash me inside and out, of all my crooked deeds, cleanse me from my sins. Just hold your lives now in front of God. 
picture them, the good times and the bad, the difficult times and the easy, and give them to him, lay them over to him, hold them out before him. now in this moment ask God ask God to to wipe away all those things which you feel might have come in the way of you and God all those moments we had a wonderful moment on Alpha the, uh, this week where we were speaking about being baptized and being washed and having the bath and then Jesus sort of comes and washes the disciples' feet. He says to, says to Peter, you don't need your whole body washed, just your feet. Just to remove the dirt of the day, the stuff we pick up. And that picture held in one of, one of the guys who came to Alpha, he, he really held onto that picture of just being washed of that little daily dirt that we pick up. So we now in this moment be washed from that daily dirt that we pick up off our feet as we walk through life. Psalm 51 carries on. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore within me a sense of being brand new. Do not throw me far away from your presence. Do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give back to me the deep delight of being saved by you. Let your willing spirit sustain me. So I pray now that the willing spirit sustains you, that the spirit falls upon you and lifts you up from wherever you are at. May the spirit sustain you this week. May the spirit hold you this week. May God speak to you in your deepest desires your deepest needs. Amen. Sing that chorus again. Lord, I give you my heart, give you my soul. Please have a seat. Let that prayer be our prayer this week. Have your way in me. Is this for me? Oh, it's for you. Oh, that's all right then. <laughs> I panicked for a moment. <laughs> so Steve, you're coming to talk to us about how we can do more, give more maybe. Work as, a Steve, work as a pray team, more, pray, pray, more, pray, pray more, pray more. That sounds good. So if we pray more, can I pray for you this moment? Me too, yeah. if, and if anyone you want to join in, put your hand out. Let's pray for Steve in this moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Steve and all that he brings to us this day. We thank you for the way he's, you've influenced him, the way you have fed him your word, and the way you have anointed him with wisdom about this word. And as he shares this moment with us, these words that you've devoted to him on his heart, I pray that as he imparts your wisdom, that our hearts will soften, that our love for you will be, will be just, will overcome us, and that we will hear your voice deep within ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you.
So, um, if we can have our, our first slide up, Mike, that would be brilliant, and then I'll do battle with the, 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 the clicker afterwards. Um, it's interesting, Phil, that you said that sort of thing. I know you didn't mean it as a throwaway comment, telling us how to do more. Well, actually, that's precisely the opposite I want to talk about, because uh, one of the things that you get, isn't it, from churches is like, do more, try harder. Uh, that's not really where we're going today. It's more about be with God more and see what happens. Um, and uh, those things, that I know you, you know those all off by heart anyway, don't you? Yes. Um, <clears throat> those are our, our marks of membership. And um, we're looking today at the kind of the bottom two, joining a team and giving regularly. And we've been, we looked at the first couple um, about two weeks ago before Remembrance Sunday. And um, as I say, we're now going on to our second lot. Um, the first two, if you look at them, uh, attending regularly, that means a, a church or a life group, and joining a life group, are there for us, you know, they're there, they're there about us so we can learn. And I want a question, ask you a question before we go any further. Do you want to grow in faith? Do you want to grow in faith? Do you want to know, with a capital K-N-O-W, God, and feel close to him? Do you want to be a faithful disciple? Now, I'm assuming that the answer to all of those is yes, uh, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, but do you want to do that? Do you want to do that? And it was amazing that that, um, that um, verse that Nikki read out um, from Revelation 3, chapter 20, because uh, uh, basically he's talking to the church at this point and saying, right, church, listen up. This is what you need to think about. Blah, 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 blah. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, and... I'm there for you. I'm standing at the door. If anybody hears my voice, open it and I'll come to you. What an amazing thought, isn't it? That the, the, God, the, God of, uh, the God of our ancestors, Jacob, the God of the, you want, he's at the university, he's just the other side of that door over there. And all you've got to do is open it and there he is. Wow. And that's, that's what those first two marks of membership are all about, actually. Because... Um, they're, they're, they're about us meeting with God. And our marks of membership are not about what the church needs. It's not what it's all about. It's what for you. They're there for you. They're a kind of a microcosm, if you like, of what it's like to be part of the kingdom of God. And they're in that order for a reason, for a really, really good reason. Because, you see, before we can serve God, we need to know him. We need to know God first, and then we can serve him. So those first two are about us um, really being fed. And we've got to get that bit right before we can go on to the next two about what we do. We start with God and then we get practical. And there's an old phrase uh, for that. It's called to abide, to abide in God. And to abide literally means uh, to stay or to remain. So you're like still remaining, you're abiding with God. He's there all around you. So to abide in Jesus means to receive, to believe, and to trust that Jesus is everything that we can possibly ever need. And that's the reason why we go to church or to join a life group, is so that we can truly, truly, truly understand what it means in our deepest hearts and so that we can live in the presence of God. We come to church to seek him. We come to church to rest in God. We come to church to abide in Jesus. that it works there we are John 15 verse 5 he who abides in me and I in him bear much fruit for without me you can do nothing now see how that works it's really important to get how this works you start with God abiding in God and then you bear fruit that's the way it works you start that way and then you bear fruit or there's another one we know this one love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your mind with all your soul soul with all your strength and then love your neighbor. So it starts off, love God, and then we get practical and we love everybody else. Get that bit right, then you can worry about bearing fruit. So I'm gonna assume you're all right on that one. Okay, you've done that bit. Okay, you're, you're, all, you're all sorted with God. All is fine, isn't it? Yep. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna move on to the second two marks of membership now. But just in case you're not quite there, just in case, um, I might just give you a little bit of some, something else to think through. Now, I could spend the rest of this talk 
telling you about what bearing fruit might look like. And I will do that a little bit at the end. But I think you already know what that is, don't you? You already know that you need to serve, that you need to give, you need to care for those who have no voice, you need to bring healing to the sick, you need to be standing up for justice. We all know that. It's there already. But do we always? Do you always do that? Do I always do that? No. And the blockage is not about not knowing what to do. It's about choices and it's about decisions, isn't it? So I want to, to look today at a very, very simple question. How do you make a godly decision? How do you do it? How do you decide to do what you already know that you need to do? Have you ever been in that situation before? Today I will not kick the cat. Today I will not be nasty to my children, my, just put on whatever it is, children, wife. Today I will do that essay that I meant to do. Today I will not spend too much, whatever it is. We all know what we need to do, don't we? It's just that we don't do it because we're rubbish. Um, God doesn't think we're rubbish. Sometimes I might think myself is rubbish. But we need spiritual discipline, don't we? And, uh, and dis- any discipline, especially spiritual discipline, is about choice. You have to decide to make God's ways your ways. Making spiritual decisions Good spiritual decisions is a partnership between you and God. There we are, Proverbs. Look at this one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Start with God, get that bit right, and your paths may be straightened out. See, our choices are who we are, aren't they? Our choices are who who we are. And what we believe and what we are and what we decide to do about it makes us who we are. And we are saved by the blood of Jesus and by his grace. But living a godly life is a choice we all have to make. And it isn't one you make once and once only. It's not a forever choice. It's one you have to do daily. Probably, if you're like me, minute by minute by minute by minute and to follow God and not our own ways in every decision that we ever make. Temptation comes in so many guises, doesn't it? And we need to avoid that and to make the right decisions so that we can bear fruit. And Jesus challenges us to make good decisions. And Matthew 6, 24 says these words, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or love the one and hate the other. So what I want to give you now is, as I say, a way of making decisions so that we can abide in God, so that we can make good decisions and bear fruit. This is what this is all about, really. So how does Jesus operate? Well, what he does, he does this. He tells us what he wants, he shows us the best way, and then he says, over to you. Over to you. It's all up to you. He never forces. He just shows us the way and then lets us decide. Will we follow or will we not? Now, Jesus' teaching is sometimes quite hard, as we know. But he gives us a model for making decisions, and one that he followed himself. The first thing Jesus did, he always does this, he always withdraws himself from the world. When we make spiritual decisions, we have to withdraw from the world system <coughs> so that we will not make worldly decisions. Jesus withdrew from the world so he could spend time in prayer. He went alone to think his way through decisions. He went into the wilderness, didn't he, for 40 days before he began his ministry. He he prayed all night long by himself before choosing the 12 disciples. He spent time alone in prayer before pretty much every decision or major circumstance in his life and ministry on earth. That's what he did. And what Jesus did is no different from what we need to do if we're going to make the right decision in life. So Jesus withdrew, and then he prayed, and then he fasted. Now, Jesus was God, and he felt it necessary to spend time in prayer. Now, I am not God. My children might think I am, don't you, Benjamin? Yes, no, he says. (coughs) But I'm humble enough to know that I'm not. Um, And none of us are God too. But we all need to pray, don't we? And Jesus needed to pray because we're not as perfect as he is. So he prayed. And then what he did after that is he withdrew, he prayed, and then he he obeyed. My meat 
is to do the will of him that sent me. And by this he meant that his food was to obey God the Father. And a good decision had to be in line with God's will. A good decision is found in God's word, which is our spiritual food. Jesus made decisions with an underlying commitment to obey the will of his Father. So we need to study our scriptures and seek God in prayer and do his will. So there we are. That's three quarters of the model. I'm going to tell you the other one in a minute. But before I tell you the last one, do you notice something about that? Everything Jesus does is about being with God, knowing him, understanding him, obeying him. And that's the first steps. So the three steps on there are all about abiding with God, knowing with God. They're part of the first part of our marks of membership. And we have to get this bit right before we can bear fruit. So what I'd like us to do now, Mike, we're going to um, have a video in a moment, it's your, your warning. Um, I'd like us to sing a song. Um, you can stay seated and either let the words wash over you or read the words or join in with it. It's an old, old song and it's called Abide With Me. And as you listen to these words or sing them, let it wash over you. And just imagine yourself in that situation where you are abiding in God and he in you. So let's listen now, shall we? There's no sound, Mike. to its close ebbs out light's little day <coughs> as joys grow dim its glories pass away change and decay Tis no bitterness, there is death sting, where grave thy victory, I triumph still if thou abide with
That's the place that we love to be, isn't it? We're in that place we love to be. And when we're in that place, then we have half a chance of making the right decision. <coughs> so the last bit about decision-making, Jesus went public. Who here has ever made a decision that they're going to change their lives and not done anything about it? Who has ever told someone that they're going to do something and then regretted it because you have to do what you said? <laughs> Jesus knew that every decision had to be declared. He was willing to tell others who he was and what he decided. And, decided, and it's so important because once you declare something, it's so much harder to go back on it, isn't it? Jesus went public, and that's what the second two of our marks of mission are all about. Going public bearing fruit. Now, being public, incidentally, before I go on, doesn't necessarily mean telling everybody everything about it, because Jesus said, when you give, you don't necessarily have to tell everybody about it. What he meant was, live outwards, live outside, and you only tell people about it when it glorifies God, or it makes you do something. Okay, We don't boast about stuff, we do it when it makes us do something, or when it glorifies God. Those are the only two reasons why we, we would boast about anything, really. As Paul says, we're not we boasting God, that's all we do. So we've already looked at, this, this is how we make decisions, you know, we, we, we withdraw, we pray, we do what God wants, we look at the scriptures, and then we, we want to be held accountable in some way, shape or form to that. So now to the issue itself, we're on about serving and giving. giving our, some of us will have loads of money and we won't have any time, some of us will have loads of time and probably no money, um, some of us will be lucky enough to have both, and sadly some people have neither. Um, but it's about really giving what we've got, whatever it might be, time or money, to God. This is what this is all about, really. And it's hard, hard teaching, because Jesus says, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wise, wise words, and ones that, if I'm honest, I find rather difficult because Jesus calls us to look at our lives honestly and to spend time thinking about really important things like money, morality, love, and justice. And he asks us to follow his example in examining life and making decisions before God. Get your decisions right, or more importantly, get the way in which you make your decisions right, and then you will find peace, and that is at the heart of our Christian message, and we will find ourselves abiding in God and he in us. It's quite easy, isn't it, to fall into the trap of wanting more. We all do it, even though we know it's not good for us. And we all know the promises are false. And we all know that having a new phone doesn't change our lives. But it does kind of feel like it just before you get it, doesn't it? And we all know that if you get a new car, actually all cars are the same. After you've driven it for a week, it's pretty much the same as the old one, really, isn't it? Maybe it starts and the other one didn't. But, um, but, but shiny things don't stay shiny for long. And we just know that. We all know that. But we kind of don't really know it, really, do we? And it's harder now than ever being bombarded by advertising. And can you honestly say that you've never coveted, never just dis desperately wanted something? Can you honestly say that? With no hands going up, yeah. But would you like to think that? Or would you like to like to think that? Or maybe you'd like to like that one day you might want to think that way. Or however many likes you want to put in front of it. Yeah, I think I'm somewhere along there. Um, you see, there's quite a lot about my life I like quite a lot at the moment, thank you very much. Um, and I don't think God's calling us to get rid of everything. That's not what it's all about. But he does ask us to be content with what we have. And to look honestly and say... Have I got too much? And if so, what can I do about it? And that's time or money, chaps, not just money. How can we be content with what we've got? Well, we can do it by making good decisions there. And one of the decisions he asks us to make is about giving. Now, in a second, if the magic thing works, not that I believe in magic, there we are. Sorry to get that one in, it's a good evangelical, by the way. Um, there. <laughs> Yay, there we are. This is Acts 20, verse 32 and onwards. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs with the needs and the needs of my companions. Everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Then when Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. And they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. And what grieved him the most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. I'll tell you what's going on about that in a second. But you could summarize Jesus' teaching in just two words. Believe and give. Believe and give. That's kind of it, really. In Luke 14, 13, Jesus says... When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous. Now, Acts 20 here, Paul is saying pretty much the same thing. And this all takes place in a place called Miletus, when Paul meets with the elders of the church at Ephesus. And it's a kind of a sad farewell. It's sort of the bit of the sort of the middle of the film when the hero is going to go off into the sunset. And, uh, and Paul is bound for Rome, you see, uh, for imprisonment, and eventually he's going to get executed. And Paul has taught them, he's raised them in faith. And now this is the last farewell. For those of you like Roger Whittaker, it's the, final, the last farewell. And it's his goodbye speech. And there are three parts to this speech. And Paul sets out his expectations for the Christian leaders who will serve after him first. In verse 28, he tells them to feed the church. Then in verses 29 to 31, he warns them against dangers that the church will face. And then finally, in verses 33 and 35, he warns them not to be greedy for personal gain, but to give for a blessing. And then verse 35 ends with these famous words, the words on which Paul has based his life, and the words of Jesus himself, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, the Bible couldn't really be plain at this point, could he? If you want to live the life you've always wanted, the way to do that is to give it all away. It's bizarre, isn't it? We are blessed in our giving. And just look at the way Paul gets his message across. First of all, he says, abide in God. Get to know him and his love. Verse 32, he says his whole farewell speech in the context of God's freely forgiving love. And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? God's love and grace can give us an inheritance. It can lead you into his presence where he will abide with you and you with him. And that's how you can live the life that you've always wanted. And then we get 33, 34, and the first bits of 34. And Paul explains this a bit more by using his own life as an example. He hasn't coveted wealth or possessions. He's worked to support the weak. Other people might see toil and stress here, but Paul sees this as a way to life and meaning. He comforts them and remembers the words of Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Trouble, of course, it's easy to say, but not so easy to do, isn't it? Why did Jesus talk about money? Why do so many of Jesus' parables discuss the appropriate and inappropriate use of money? Because you see, the thing is, my friends, Jesus talks more about money than pretty much anything else except the kingdom of God and hell. And you might think that Jesus talks lots about love. He does, but it's actually quite a long way down the list. We're, we're We're on to hell and money and the kingdom of God more than anything else because there's such important things about the way we've lived because money cannot buy you happiness, can it? We know that. We all know that. But what it can do is the way we use our money can influence how happy we are. And giving is one of the crucial steps in living the life that we've always wanted. See how... We come back once again and again and again to choices. We have the choice and the chance to decide if we trust the Lord and believe his word. And we're invited on an adventure of faith. And this is the path, the path of living the life that we've always wanted to do. There's a lovely story I heard of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to find a a fisherman uh, sitting quite lazily on his boat. Anybody here like fishing? Sitting there fishing... Why aren't you out there fishing, says the industrialist. Well, I've caught enough fish for today, says the, uh, the fisherman. 
But if you caught more fish, you could earn more money. And you could buy a better boat, and you could go deeper, and you could catch loads more fish. And then you could purchase bigger nets and catch even more fish, and then make more money. And soon you'd have a fleet of boats, and then you'd be rich like me. And the fisherman said, well, well I don't want to do that. What, what, what's the point of that? Well, then you can sit down and relax and enjoy life, said the industrialist. What do you think I'm doing now? The fisherman replied as he looked out to sea. Choices, choices, choices. Jesus gave us his four-point plan for making decisions. And his most influential disciple, Paul, followed that pattern as well. He withdrew into Galatia. He prayed, he obeyed, and he told all the time about what he did. And then Paul went on to bear fruit. He spent the rest of his life preaching the gospel and founding churches. So, as I draw to a close now, back to this whole idea of giving and of serving. God is generous to us, isn't he? He gives us time, he gives us life, he gives us money, he gives us things, and we're asked by God to tithe, and that means give 10% to the Christian work. And 10% is a good place to start, you know, but I know many people here could even contemplate doing that, and I get that. What, so what we ask as a church is that you give something, and something regularly. 10p a week is fine. Absolutely fine if it's every week. £1,000 a week is fine. Whatever it is, doesn't really matter. Anything that we give, as long as we make a commitment to do so, that's all that really matters. Because God loves anything that we give. If you can give all of your time to help the church, that's fantastic. If you can give just something every now and then and commit to do it, that's fine too. What God wants is our commitments. He doesn't care how big your wallet is. He just declares that you open it and just give out whatever you can. He doesn't care how much time you've got to give. He just cares that we give some of it that's precious to us, to him. And the rest is up to between you and God. And all I urge you is to take this whole thing seriously. And we do that by abiding in God. And from that place of peace, we'll be led into the place of fruit. Amen. Thank you, Steve. And so uh, we're just going to prepare for communion as, as we're going to celebrate communion at this moment. Uh, you might be a little bit rusty on this, this fork, the one we're going to use. It's uh, a format that is, um, we've done, we did it a few months ago, um, and it or, demands a little bit of a audience participation. It's the story, and it's telling of Christ's story. And as we tell of Christ's story, we then say, this is my story. This is my song. This is mine. I own this. And so when I ask you to, to say a response, please join in and say this and take ownership that Jesus' story is our story as we prepare for communion. Majesty, God of heaven, living in me, gentle Savior, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end, all within me falls at your throne, your majesty. to say
So can we have the words on the screen, please, Mike? So we start with the peace. Hmm. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's say the peace to each other. Peace with you, Steve. <laughs> peace with you. Peace with you, everyone. So, so we've made peace with each other. We've said sorry for the things we've done wrong. And we're ready to come to the communion and, and ask to become closer to God. This table is the table for the broken, the table for the incomplete, the table where we come to be restored. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. To the darkness, Jesus came as your light. With signs of faith and words of hope, he touched the untouchables with love and washed the guilty clean. This is his story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. The crowds came to see your son, yet the end they turned on him. On the night before he was betrayed, he came to the table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Jesus then gave thanks for the wine and he took the cup and he gave it and said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is our story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free. Defying death, he rose again and alive with you to plead for us and all the world. This is our story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. And we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Oh, and forever. Amen. Blessing and honor and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. So we'll have two stations, one at the back and one up here at the front. And uh, Mick will show you which way to go.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you.
Lord, you have broken. Oh. Um. Lord, we have broken your bread and received your life. By the power of your Spirit, keep us always in your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Isn't it good? God is good. All the time? Did someone say all the time? All the time. All the time. Nice work. Proud of you. <laughs> Shall we just say one th prayer of thanks? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment that we can share together as one body, living together, breathing together for the celebration of your glory and no one else's. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. One final song of worship as we declare that Jesus is our firm foundation. He is the rock in which we build our lives upon. He is our cornerstone.
If any of you would like prayer ministry, Sherry and Rosie are there in the corner, and uh, they'd love to pray for you if you need it. So let me send you out with a blessing. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this family. I thank you for our community here in this place, and I pray that you will bless them, that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they will be blessed by your power and strength that their homes will be filled with peace and their that your love swells up within their hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I came in a, like a bar too early wait, wait. on the fill, and wait, I was like, oh, this, really? I came in too, way too early. No, but it was fine because it worked because I started singing and you were still building, so yeah, it, yeah. Actually, it, it actually worked. Better. Yeah. Just. Yeah. 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 Yeah.